to suffer for him. Stand, Stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught. Be alert. Stand firm in the faith. Be brave and strong. Your every action must be done with love. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect. Not, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty.
and noblest act that any person can do. When men worship, God is satisfied. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. Amazing, isn't it? And when you worship, you are fulfilled. Think about this. Why did Jesus Christ come? He came to make worshipers out of rebels. We who were once self-centered have to be completely changed so that we can shift our attention outside of ourselves and become able to worship Him. mentioned last Sunday, I am beginning today uh, a new series of sermons, and this series has to do with questions that need answers. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at a lot of questions that 
people are always asking, but I think that many of these questions are being asked during these days, uh, perhaps more than they have been in a long time. Uh, adversity, shared adversity, worldwide adversity through this pandemic causes people to be very introspective and very uh, thoughtful and questioning about their lives, about the future for themselves, their children, and their grandchildren. And so these questions, I think, that we're going to be looking at the next few weeks are the kinds of questions that, that maybe you have been thinking about or friends or family have asked. And so uh, we're going to do our best to see what we can find from the scripture. Uh, I, I need to say right out front that uh, there are some questions that uh, we do our best to answer, but we will not have a complete answer until we find ourselves with God in eternity and believing by faith that God indeed has the answers for us as to why uh, God does in this world the way that he does, uh, how his will is uh, achieved. And so today we begin with one of those questions and I want to start out by telling you a little story that uh, I remember from a long, long time ago. It seems that one evening, as it was getting dark, uh, a mom asked her son, who was about, oh, maybe seven, eight years old, to uh, go outside and get the broom. And the little boy said, well, mom, it's dark out there. And his mother said, son, you know that the Lord's out there. You don't need to be afraid. So the little boy went over to the door, opened it a crack, and looked out there, and a kind of a small voice said, Lord, if you're out here, would you hand me the broom? That's the kind of question that, in a, in a different way, that a lot of people are asking. Is anybody out there? And that has to do with with some things like the beginning of the world, the origin of we humankind, and of course, the very existence of God. I want to call your attention this morning to Acts chapter 17, and I'm going to be reading verses 22 through 28. Paul is in Athens, Greece. And we read that he stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far 
from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. There are evidently not a lot of people, particularly in our country, who have come to the conclusion that there is no God. Most people believe in a higher power. But there are some who do not believe in any kind of, of God, any kind of higher power at all. It's uh, interesting, and uh, I guess you could say a little bit sad, that uh, the late President Ronald Reagan's son, Ron Reagan, is often seen on television representing uh, people who claim to be atheist. Now, that is his right, and I guess that is his belief. But most surveys say that between 74% and 96% of Americans have some kind of, of a belief in a higher power. But there are a lot of people who claim to be agnostic. They say they don't know because it's impossible to know whether or not there is a God. Anthropologists believe that we humankind have an intense desire to believe in God. The psychologist Freud thought it was this innate desire that led humans to come up with and to develop the very idea of God. Other great thinkers, such as Augustine, believe that this innate desire is in us because God put it there. He wrote, O oh God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Now, in our text, we see that Paul has discovered a very religious people in Athens. They have fashioned their own gods. They had an altar, as Paul said, that was inscribed to an unknown god. The fact that you are taking time to listen to this this morning says one of two things about you. That is, you are either very foolish or you have embraced this truth that Paul speaks so clearly and so uh, incredibly uh, intelligent when he says God is not far from each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being. The question is why did Paul and why do we believe that? It's vitally important for us living at a time in which people are asking questions in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of all of the uncertainty that is going on in our country today. It is so important that as people of faith that we know what we believe and that we know why we believe it. So, why do you believe that there is someone out there who knows us individually and loves us with a love beyond anything that we could ever experience or ever, ever uh, give ourselves as humankind? We believe this, first of all, because of our individual experience. 
Paul had an amazing story. You remember it. Paul was Jewish. He was Roman. He was well-educated. And when he heard about this Jesus, this Jesus who had died on a cross in Jerusalem, and that amazingly, people, many people, were beginning to turn to following this Jesus, believing that he, in fact, was sent from God himself. Paul thought that was the most ridiculous thing that anybody could possibly believe. In fact, he thought it was so, as he said, scandalous that he was doing everything he could to destroy this idea. One day, he was on his way seeking to do just exactly that. And all of a sudden, he was blinded by a light. You've read that amazing story. How Paul was spoken to and overcome by the presence of the resurrected Christ. And in that moment, Paul began a journey, a journey of self-discovery over the next few days, a journey of God discovery, that the God that Paul did believe in indeed had come to be with us through his son, Jesus Christ, and that Jesus had lived and taught and walked with people for three years, and after his death, the cruel death of the cross, on the morning of the third day, that the tomb was discovered to be empty because Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, was indeed the Christ of God and had overcome death. And that experience that day and the next few days changed. It turned around the life of this man, Paul. So Paul believed because of his own experience that the God of the universe had revealed himself in the resurrected Christ. I remember a wonderful saying that an older woman uh, used to say that was well-respected in her faith. She said, my God has happened to me. The fact is, though, that people with a postmodern mindset say, well, that's fine, but truth is relative. What is true for you is not necessarily true for anyone else. They want to know, <coughs> is there any evidence for the existence of God other than your own experience. A man by the name of Lee Strobel was a self-professed atheist. His wife, however, was a Christ follower. And he was always incredulous about why his wife was a believer. And so he set out to make his own investigation to be able to back up his belief that there was no God. But because of his study and because of his search, he, after two years of intense investigation, came to the startling conclusion in his words, it takes more faith to not believe in God than it does to believe. Why did this man become a Christ follower? Why do we? Well, 
there is this this law called the law of cause and effect. It is the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the universe is running out of energy. Now, if that's true, then the universe cannot be eternal. That would mean that it has an ending and therefore had a beginning. If it had a beginning, then it must have had a cause. Some scientists who are also believers, who are Christ followers, traditionally have referred to this, uh, this beginning as the Big Bang or the cosmic explosion that brought the universe into being. And because they were believers, believed that somehow the Big Bang, the beginning of all creation began with God saying, let there be life. The question then be became, what, what did cause the beginning? In 1992, as a result of the COBE, COBE satellite, scientists were able to confirm this concept of the Big Bang. And about that experience, Dr. George Smoot said, it was like looking at the face of God. Dr. Robert Jastrow, a renowned astronomer, said about the same findings of the satellite. We see how the astronomical evidence leads us to a biblical view of the origins of the world. Jastro also went on to write these words. The scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, for that scientist, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. I love the experience occasionally of visiting the ocean, the Pacific, the Atlantic, or some others in various parts of the world. And one of the things that I love about visiting the ocean side is to walk on the beach. I remember one morning when Linda and I were walking on the beach of the Atlantic Ocean. And as we walked, we stopped to collect seashells. And I was fascinated by all the shapes, the sizes, and the types of seashells that one stretch of beach holds. They each had a very distinctive and very intricate design. I agree with the writer James Emery White, who wrote in his book, A Search for the Spiritual, to believe something so wondrous is the result of an accident would be like believing that the latest software application from Microsoft is the result of an explosion in a computer warehouse. Consider this, this watch that I have on my wrist. If I found one like it on an isolated beach, what would I think? If you found a watch in an isolated area like that, would you assume that it was there by some accident of nature? Or would you somehow understand that the watch must have had a maker who designed it and constructed it? I ask you the question a moment ago, 
about your own belief in God and your own experiences that would lead you to believe in God. Let me, let me conclude with one of the strong reasons that I believe in God. And I would call this human personality. By that, I mean that the fact as humans that we are able to think and reflect and decide. I mentioned earlier that an innate desire to believe in God has been a part of the human experience from the beginning. This common human experience has fostered an innate sense of morality. For instance, in every civilization since the beginning of time, selfishness is never admired, but loyalty is always admired. C.S. Lewis said, before he became a follower of Christ, that his argument was that, that the God of the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But then he said, I ask myself, how had I gotten the idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a straight, a line straight unless he has some idea of a crooked line. Mark Twain once said, man is the only animal who blushes. Now, where did that human capacity come from? I believe as a part of our individual personhood, we are given a great gift. And I believe that that is a is an argument for the existence of God. This is the gift of individual freedom. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, one of the great thinkers of days gone by in Russia, said he learned in a concentration camp that there was one thing his captors could not take away from him, and that was his freedom to, to, to choose how he would react to various circumstances. I believe that God has given us this incredible gift. I know that many of you who are part of the Gaston Oaks family, you have made the choice and you are making the choice to believe that indeed there is someone out there. Someone the Bible tells us is the eternal God who has come to us in the person of his son Jesus. And that belief, more than anything else, is determining how you are living your life this very day. Paul said God wants, uh, wants us to reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from us. Now, we have a choice to make. The choice is to believe or not believe. How will you decide? Heavenly Father, thank you for this freedom that you have given to each of us to decide, to choose for ourselves if we believe in you as our God and to choose whether or not we will follow you by following your son, Jesus the Christ, who gave us such a path, who gave us understanding of how to live how to live in the good days, but also how to live in days like these that are not so good. Father, guide us in our choice today 
of living this life by choosing to believe and trust you as our God. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship this morning. As you go about your day and your week, we hope you will think of those that you saw on the prayer list and of the things that you've learned today in the sermon and the things in worship that the Lord has put on your hearts. So now as we've been the people of God gathered together, let us be the people of God scattered, salt and light, making a difference in our world for Jesus' sake. Thank you.